that are putting on this briefing today. Committee for Children, I'm Executive Director of Committee for Children. Uh, my name is Joan Duffel. And uh, Committee for Children is a national, actually a global organization that focuses on teaching children social and emotional skills, safety skills, and other kinds of skills to keep them safe and attached to school and successful in school and in life. And with me uh, representing Hazel, the other sponsoring organization, is Karen Neeney. Hello, everybody. Um, I am Karen Neeney, and I am the CEO of Castle and Castle. Um, CASEL is an organization that is dedicated to bringing social emotional learning to every student in the country. Um, we are very focused on the research and best practices and look forward to sharing good quality work with you and, and all of the people that you represent. Thank you. So, um, do we have not yet okay Not yet. Sorry. so I think I'm gonna hand this over now thank you again for being here I'm gonna hand this television over. they say stretch just keep talking oh yeah. I don't know how to do that but you do nice. <laughs> so uh, our moderator today for this briefing and uh, he'll be introducing people uh, and moderating the whole panel is Tim Schreiber uh, I think he's a familiar face to most of you, and uh, what you may not know about him, and you, you probably know that he uh, chairs the Special Olympics and has a real attachment to that organization and a legacy around that, but what you may not know is that he is also the board chair of CASEL, the organization that uh, Karen is now CEO of and that Roger Weisberg in the audience has been the leader of for many years. And Tim is uh, going to moderate this panel and really help us move through this presentation. So Great, thank, you, thank you. And thank you all for coming. We, uh, we're expecting Congressman Ryan any moment, so we'll be flexible at the top end. We won't try to dive in too quickly. I see a lot of jaws moving, which is also very good. So you, uh, you don't have to focus 100% just yet, except that we'd like to introduce ourselves as a panel. And uh, for those of you that have packets, in the packets you'll see biographies of uh, all three of my colleagues to the right. In their biographies that will tell you all of their professional achievements, all of the reasons why they're esteemed and recognized and celebrated in this country and around the world, all the reasons they're uh, uh, appreciated by children, educators, scholars, and, and the like. Uh, so I've asked them not to repeat all that in introducing themselves, but rather to tell you something, anything, about themselves from a, either a social or an emotional point of view, something about their lives that might allow us to connect even in this formal setting a little bit socially and emotionally. And so I'll start uh, immediately to my right and allow self-introductions in this regard. And then we'll uh, welcome Congressman Ryan. Okay. Well, I'm Maurice Elias. Pleasure to be here. Um, my uh, social and emotional connection is, is to the one child I think I th that I think about more than anyone else, and that's my three-year-old grandson. And all the way up here on the train, in spite of trying to prepare for the briefing, I couldn't get the many, many times that he's made me listen to Jake and the Neverland Pirates <laughs> out of my head. And I'm hoping that I'll get so engrossed today that maybe that tune will leave me for a few minutes. We'll see. Good afternoon. I'm Janice Taguchi, and I'm Executive Director at Denise Louie Education Center in Seattle, Washington. And my social-emotional um, connection is my 14-year-old son. So before I left uh, Seattle yesterday morning at around 8 o'clock, that meant that he was on his own to get himself to school and out of bed and woken up, in which he successfully did. So I'm very proud of him. Uh, <laughs> good for you. And I'm Keith Matheny, and uh, my SEL fact would be uh, my son's bar mitzvah is this Saturday. We have 200 guests coming, oh, wow. so I have to hurry back no matter who I'm talking to. And also, I have 300 of my current students uh, following on Twitter, so please tweet. They'll be looking forward to it. And, um and uh, I'll say that the, 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 the emotional connection I'd like to share today is that I had the honor of being in Keith's class about uh, four or five weeks ago in Austin. And the, uh, it was a class of freshmen, which he'll talk a little bit more about. But the, the lesson of the day was on apologies and the ways in which people heal relationships. 
Um, and I thought to myself, this is a fairly basic set of lessons. Well, I spent the whole day with 14-year-olds uh, practicing, role-playing, critiquing, and exploring the idea of apology. Uh, I got home later that night and I had an apology to make to my wife. And let me just tell you, this stuff really works. <laughs> because if you can get away with apologizing more effectively after 27 years of marriage and your wife smiles, I'm telling you, that's the best recommendation I have for social and emotional learning. So thank you all again for coming. Before we start, I, I do want to make a special thanks and, and invite up to the front here. Uh, our, really our greatest friend in Congress, the person who more than any other has championed the idea of social and emotional learning as a cornerstone of this nation's education, this nation's public life, uh, the man who not only represents a great uh, state, a great district, but also a great idea that we can all, in being more mindful, uh, be more successful as Americans, as citizens, and as human beings. Congressman Tim Ryan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, just wanted to stop by and say hello and thank you, and obviously uh, hello to Roger and the great work that Castle is doing. Um, we, I just left a hearing on poverty in the Budget Committee, and the themes are so similar, and I think the ideas of what can help move kids out of poverty and into thriving, self-sufficient adults uh, surround this idea of making sure that they have the resiliency that they need to be able to move forward. That life's going to knock you down. Some of us get better starts than others, but there's always going to be challenges in that it's not, as uh, Secretary Duncan often says, it's not a soft skill uh, to be resilient. That's an essential component of learning in the 21st century. And when we're producing young men and women that are going to go out into the world and it used to be when I was going to school, oh, you're going to have seven jobs in your lifetime. You're going to have seven different jobs, so you better be flexible. Today they're saying you're going to have 25 different jobs in the course of your lifetime. And you have more information coming at you, more social challenges coming at you. And I uh, got married a year ago, and I have an 11-year-old uh, stepson and, an, and a 10-year-old stepson, you know? And... Uh, my buddy says, if you ever want to go from being a liberal to a conservative, have a 10-year-old daughter. Um, <laughs> and there's a little bit of truth to that. <laughs> but you think of the world that these young kids are going to go into. I think the work that, that you're doing here is so critically important to give them the skills they need to, to feel cared about, to feel loved, to feel secure, and then to be able to take those calculated risks that we all need to take. So I wanted to just come and say, we're going to continue to advocate for this on, on the Hill. I want to thank Susan Davis, who's uh, been a great leader uh, on this issue as well. She's been terrific. We're sending a letter to the Department of Education to encourage investments in this kind of thing. And we can't just be strictly test scores in the traditional way. There's a whole new other world that will feed and enhance that world as well. And you guys are hitting the nail on the head, and I just wanted to come by and say thank you very much. So keep up the great work. Thank you. Goodbye. Congressman Davis is supposed to be here. Congresswoman, excuse me, Davis is supposed to be here momentarily, and she'll get a chance to tell us, we hope, about the bill she introduced yesterday on the floor and which we're all very excited about. But let's not wait, let's dive in. Um, uh, so each of us will speak for a few minutes. We've got some, uh, some fun, I hope, audio visuals to share. The, pur the purpose of uh, today's briefing is to try, in my view, to make the case that the country is at a tipping point. Uh, the country is at a moment of pivoting uh, where the dialogue and the discussion about education is changing. Educators are demanding that change. Teachers are supporting it. Uh, good science uh, is pointing us in a new and very powerful direction. And we believe uh, that the work that's been done over the course of several decades to try to sharpen and refine the ideas, the concepts, the practices, and the measures for enhancing the social and emotional development of children is the pivot towards which the country is turning. And we are hoping today to share with you at a very quick level why we think it's so important, why we think it works, uh, and why we think the country, in particular uh, national um, policymakers, ought to be paying close attention to it. 
So let me make a few introductory comments. Uh, first, this will sound ridiculous on Capitol Hill. Uh, this will sound uh, perfunctory. This is something you might learn in a Psych 101 class in high school. Um, but we believe it uh, is the centerpiece of what we have to remind ourselves about education. Teaching and learning is a relationship. It is not supported by relationships. It's not enhanced by relationships. It's not complemented by relationships. The relationship uh, it is uh, a, a dimension of what teaching and learning is. Uh, it, it is a constructive act between two people who are bonded around some common purpose to achieve some other goal. It is not a dispassionate transaction between a machine and a part. It is not a dispassionate uh, movement of data over a cable into a microchip. It is a relationship. And if we remember only one thing, at least from my brief remarks, I hope you will remember that as we think about education, as we think about public policy, as we think about the needs of children, if we are constantly reminded that everything that has to happen in education in American schools has to happen through a relationship, we will be reminded of the centrality of this idea for the work we're all trying to do. How do we illustrate this point? Uh, one of my mentors, Jim Comer, uh, showed me this slide almost 30 years ago. Uh, he said, what's the difference, uh, Tim? I was a 25-year-old teacher at the time. What's the difference between the shape on the left and the shape on the right? There's only one difference. Uh, there's not inherently one is not inherently more interesting than the other. The only difference is that the shape on the left has a significant adult that the child is attached to, and that adult wants the child to learn the meaning of that shape. There is no other reason why the child will try to understand the letter A or the letter E or as opposed to a Chinese character or a Korean character or a creative shape. The only reason the child will try to understand the meaning of shape one is because a significant adult wants him or her to do so. Fairly basic. So how do we promote these relationships? Well, the best thing we can say about what we've learned in social and emotional learning is that if we want to reduce issues like poverty, the achievement gap, behavior problems, mental health problems, we ought to think as educators. And educators are fundamentally in the purpose, in the business of promoting development. The best way to reduce the likelihood that a child will have significant trouble in school, significant disruptions to positive and optimal development. The best way to reduce the chance that development will take a bad turn and result in the need for interventions and or treatment, the best way is to promote good development. Uh, and while we think of this very clearly around the subject of academics, we think it's obvious that you start with learning vowels if you want to learn Shakespeare. It's obvious that you start with learning sentence structure if you want to learn poetry. It's obvious in the academic sense, but it's not quite as obvious in the social and emotional learning sense. We want it to become just as obvious. So what is social and emotional learning? I won't read this because it's the kind of work that uh, people up here uh, have in your files and on your folders and on your desks and in piles. But suffice to say that after uh, several decades of work, the idea of refining the meaning of the social and emotional dimensions of learning has uh, arrived at a definition, that that definition has been pioneered by uh, Roger Weisberg and hundreds of really very terrific scholars around the country over the several decades. And we have come to this definition and begun to test it aggressively. It has been translated into this now, I think, quite well-known wheel of skills and values and attitudes, two of which center on self uh, and internal management and awareness, two of which center on social uh, awareness and management, and the fifth of which centers on good decision making and the kinds of skills and values required to make optimal decisions for children and adults. In the fine print at the bottom of this slide, you'll see an important statistic that's just about a year old. When teachers look at this, uh, at this dimension of learning, more than 75% will say that the instruction in these skills, the enhancement of these qualities and values in their classrooms will result in increased academic performance. So the idea that we're splitting skills into soft and hard, cognitive and emotional, good, you know, real and touchy-feely, that one set of issues is kumbaya and the other is how do you get a job. That is a false dichotomy. It has been perpetrated on educators for far too long and part of our agenda is to end it. Uh, again, up here we don't need to dwell on these statistics, but notwithstanding the idea that 
dropout rates are going down, which is good, and in many pockets of the country, achievement rates are going up. We still know uh, that the level of behavior problems and uh, destructive behavior is much too high in American schools. Uh, the chronic disengagement from school, in some ways, is the most heartbreaking of these numbers. Uh, somewhere around half of kids, by the time they reach high school, feel chronically disengaged from the relationships in that school and from the content uh, that they're being asked to master. Uh, again, uh, uh, very uh, troubling data here uh, about uh, children's capacity to anticipate the consequences of their actions and to think through making good decisions. How many feel that school is a caring place? We've we're beginning to talk more and more about climate. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, less than a third. Um, so now you may be thinking if you're, if you're a veteran of the education wars, well, we've got all these programs. We've got PBIS. We've been through the character education issues. We're supporting pupil personnel and student support services. Isn't all that uh, social and emotional learning? Some places do good assemblies. A good teacher does this already, some people will say. Uh, the answer to that is, in some ways, yes, but in some ways, no, because what most schools feel like is the chart uh, pioneered by Roger and Mo that you see here in front of you. Uh, lots of good things going on, but in a crazy dysfunctional way. Dysfunctional in part because public policy asks people to do uh, one thing after another without a common framework. Dysfunctional in part because we don't have a common framework around which to think, dysfunctional in part for a lot of reasons. Our hope is that if we take the skill and attitude and value dimensions of social emotional learning, ground them in good uh, educational practice, we can take the average school, which looks too much like the, the picture at the top, and turn it in to the picture at the bottom. What would this look like? Again, too much detail here to cover in, uh, in, in, in a lot of uh, depth. But let me just point out that when we think classroom, we think scope and sequence. We don't think activities. We don't think events. We think scope and sequence. We think what are the ways in which starting in kindergarten, through the kindergarten year, through the first grade year, we can teach the skills, enhance the culture, model the activities, evaluate progress, and ensure fidelity to highly evidence-based programs. When we think climate, we think the same way, and when we think about the relationships between schools and communities, these multiple domains in which children live and grow up, in which adults live and, and educate, are all areas where we try to bring an evidence-based approach to implementation of high-quality programs. Uh, what happens when it's implemented well? Uh, good things. Fewer conduct problems, higher achievement scores, academic success, and positive school climate and social behavior, as evidenced by, most recently, uh, the kind of seminal uh, meta-analysis published uh, just about two years ago by Roger and Joe Durlach and others that pointed out that across multiple domains, when these programs are highly, uh, when they're well implemented and evidence-based, we see 11, uh, uh, an average of 11 percentile point uh, gains in uh, standardized achievement tests. So in improving the attachment of children to school, the relationships with their teachers, their capacity to self-regulate, their capacity to relate well to others, their capacity to bond and feel agency towards pro-social goals, guess what? You get better learning. Shouldn't sound like uh, uh, rocket science, but uh, unfortunately, we're at a moment where it's still not well understood in, in the country, although that's changing rapidly. Uh, so uh, we want there to be a news flash. Uh, uh, I'm not 30 second warning. I've never been on time in my life. I'm about to be on time for the first time in history. I just got a 30 second warning. Uh, the United States leads the world. This is a picture from my other life, but this is a picture from an American high school uh, where children have been challenged uh, to become agents of change, to adopt their own projects, to adopt their own agenda for improving school climate, where they're inspired and encouraged through good social and emotional learning programs to understand the problems in their schools around bullying and then create the kinds of frameworks and activities that will change that themselves. And you see this, um, yeah, I guess uh, in some ways, I think this is the sign that was maybe most uh, powerfully seen last night at the Clippers game. I think uh, lots of fans saying, we are one. Um, there is a moment. Uh, young people, teachers, educators are looking for ways in which we can work together, uh, promote unity, 
Um, it might come from community-based organizations and, and, and institutions and parents. It might come from administrators. It might come from kids themselves. It certainly will come from teachers. If we do this right, we can really, I think, make a, an enormously important contribution to ensuring that every child has the best possible chance to develop appropriately and positively, learn as much as they possibly can, and feel included and in belonging in a school uh, that they love and care about. So I'll stop there um, and uh, hand it over to uh, accept Susan, oh, Congressman Davis is here. So um, we will stop there and welcome Congressman Susan Davis who yesterday introduced House Resolution 4509, the newest and most important current piece of legislation, adopting a framework for social and emotional learning in the title that supports teachers. Congresswoman Davis, we're thrilled to have you. And we're very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. How is everybody? I know you've been sitting a while, you're probably getting a little hungry. Can I just uh, see with a show of hands, how many of you are here from many of the nonprofits that are very supportive of this legislation? Great, that's, that's good to know. And staff members as well from different offices? Terrific, kind of half and half. Uh, but, it, but it's good to know, and I certainly want to thank you all. Thank you, Tim, as well. We just met, so nice to meet I don't you. know you, but I was really <laughs> impressed <friends> by, <laughs> by everything that you had to say. And I also want to, of course, applaud my colleague, Tim Ryan, uh, because he really has been the champion and leading the way uh, in SEL legislation, and I'm delighted to have an opportunity to, to work with him. As you know, we did drop our bill yesterday, and I was pleased to have a chance to do that, and I guess it was a bonus that Secretary Arne Duncan was at the Education Committee yesterday and had a chance to ask him about that as well. And I think that his response you know, was, was a great one, and I think that there are a lot of doubters out there, and that's why I wanted to ask him, so you know, what, what does this mean? Because I, I went through some of these, um, I guess the, the health care for for kids uh, and clinics wars in San Diego many, many years ago. I was a school board member in the 80s, and I could tell you that when we tried to introduce, and we were successful in it eventually, an opportunity for young people to go to school and to actually have a primary care provider who could help them, not just with physical issues, but with men mental health issues as well, with wellness issues. Uh, we had people from, it felt like throughout the country, who descended on San Diego to say, no, 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 this is a job of parents. You don't do anything in this area. And they were very alarmed by that. What we know now is that that's not the case, that having a place for young people to go and to have a chance to, you know, to share and to become advocates for one another in, in their wellness is a good thing. It's a good thing for all students. And so I think that's where I come from in bringing this bill forth and in working certainly with Michelle on my staff now, who's a, a fellow and working uh, so well with us and trying to see what are some of these pieces. And I loved your chart because I think that really does explain, yes, we have a lot of programs. I was just at the Holocaust Memorial Service and that is about remembrance, but it's also about rebirth. And that really is a message that many of our teachers uh, try and, and implement in their schools and across school districts everywhere. There are a number of programs, but trying to have a framework for that, trying to have a way that we connect it with research, that we connect it with grants that are out there but could be utilized in a different way. That's what this is all about, and that's what my legislation is about, and I know that you have that information as well. The other thing I wanted to just mention really briefly, because I spent a few days, you know, we had our recess period um, the last two weeks, and one of the things that I really like to do is to go out to, to businesses, high-tech companies in my district, but also to manufacturing companies, and to have a chance to talk to them about what they do and how they hire. What are they looking for? And what they're looking for, they're looking for problem solvers. They're looking for people who can sit down and can weigh and balance what's happening in their environment and try and contribute to that in a very productive way. He's looking for grit in some ways, and we're talking about the people who just come in and kind of do their job, 
but people who go beyond that, who, who add value because they're thinking all the time, how can we make this work for the people that we're trying to work for? And it was great to talk to them about that issue. And that's what I think we're trying to do as well with this legislation, to respond to employees who and employers who really know that when people come to them and they've experienced a very positive way of working with others, I mean, it's a little bit like, you know, in kindergarten, you know, uh, you know what we learn from those experiences, but how we take them into our lives. And that's what we're trying to capture. And, you know, sometimes people feel that, you know what, kids are going to learn this stuff on the natural. Well, they may with good teachers and obviously with parents and the community and whether it's scouting, whatever it is that they engage in. But to take that and be able to take it to a different level, that's what we're looking for in this kind of legislation. And I think it's uh, really, I hope that we can move this forward, we can connect it to the very areas that, that we know would make a real difference. And I thank you so much for being part of that, for helping us out as we worked on this legislation and help us to collect the kind of hard evidence on this. Because sometimes, quite honestly, we've got to convince others that this makes a difference and that it will make a difference in the lives of young people and their achievement and more than anything else and what they want to be able to do with their lives. They want to find a fulfilling job that they're passionate about and a career they want to find a way that they can give back to a community. And when people are happy and they connect with who they are and how they can work in an environment that really values their, their skills, but even more so their, their talent, their ingenuity, their ability to innovate, to do things in a different way when they see a need, that's what everybody wants and I think that's what we want for our kids and we want to connect with that at an early enough age that they value that as well. So thank you all so much for what you've done. And thank you. Dr. Elias. All right, great. Well, that was, that was wonderful to hear, to say the least. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to hear. And I think, apropos of what Tim said earlier, I think we've passed the tipping point. I frankly think that if you've got a child or a grandchild that's ever set foot in a school or you want them to set foot in a school, we know what kind of school we want them to go to. And I want to talk a little bit about, in the context of what we've been speaking about more generally, if we're successful with the legislation, what would our schools look like? What difference would this make? And I do want to make the point now that in the same way as one might pick up reading, one might pick up math, one might pick up scientific knowledge, one might pick up musical or artistic talent, well, that's all true, but we teach them. And now we have to add to the list social and emotional competencies because the world in which our kids are going to live and thrive require that competency in the same way as all the others. And if, you know, I collect newspaper articles, and you can't go very long without seeing articles that show how this is being valued by folks who are not in education. A lead article in the Times, Sunday Times, was about the moral child. Most frequently sent article recently by Thomas Friedman was about the Google executives, and what are they looking for? The banner headline in that article was, it's not what, about your GPA, it's what you can do. They no longer look at GPA as a criterion for hiring because there are other skills that are now more important. And the pen that I brought today is from the Financial Planning Standards Council of Canada, where my colleagues and I have been working extensively with these folks because they have come to realize that emotional intelligence is one of the most critical qualities that people need if they're going to be good stewards of their money and good stewards of other people's money. So, we are in a situation now where what we're talking about is feasible and necessary. And the common core, which we're all concerned about, will not be able to succeed if we don't combine all of the different elements of thinking, feeling, doing, 
and I'll go into that a little bit more later on. But it's about the climate of the school, it's about the skills and the habits of mind. All of those are necessary for the success of the Common Core. Now, what it looks like in school, let's take a day in the life of a kid going to school for a moment. If we look at the orange box and it talks about success in school and life, because I think we all agree the point for kids is not just success in school, it's success in life. And this box and this set of boxes comes from a book uh, uh, edited by Castle folks, 2004, Social and Emotional Learning, What Does the Research Say? I'll save you about 25 bucks. You can just look at these boxes. You don't have to get the book. It's a good book, but you know, it's a long. So if we, if we just start from the orange box and work out backwards, what does it say about a child coming into a school? It says the first thing they want to be is recognized. They want to be greeted. And if you think about your own life, you know how important it is to be greeted and welcomed. And in a good school, we know that their day, getting into school has been kind of crazy. They've been through a lot of stuff. They need a little bit of a transition. They don't want to jump right into learning before the kids are ready. So good schools try to have a little bit of, a, of an emotional transition. And a lot of Fortune 500 companies do the exact same thing. They don't expect the employees to hit the, hit the door, hit the desk, and get going. That, that's not what the most successful companies do. And when kids then come into the school, they want to do something where they matter, where they feel they matter, where they have a sense of purpose and pride in being here. Why am I here? Am I here to generate high test scores or am I here to do something important? So I need to be doing some kind of a project. I need to be part of a group that's doing some meaningful work. Maybe I need to have some leadership responsibilities, or maybe I'm going to be engaged in service. These are the kinds of pedagogies that build social and emotional competencies. And, and because I matter, because I come to 180 school days and I matter, I want to learn. And if I want to learn, then I want to be in a classroom where I'm going to want to contribute. And I want to be called on when I raise my hand. And I want to have a classroom that's going to teach me something. And it's going to ultimately, sorry about that, and because I know something, I want to be able to share it with people. So I want you to teach me social and emotional competencies. I want to learn how to work in groups with people. I want to learn how to control my emotions and not fly off the handle all the time. And I want to be able to know what you're feeling and thinking. It's important to me. And if I feel welcomed and I know that I have an important role in the school, that I matter, and I'm learning stuff and I share it, well, guess what? If you look at the, the box that comes circles back to the orange box, I'm less likely to get involved in drugs and alcohol and smoking and bullying people and premature sexual behavior and driving like a lunatic. Why? Because my life matters. It's, it's risky for me. I got something to lose. A and that's how the whole circle comes into play. Every time a kid comes in to a school, that's characterized by social and emotional learning and meaning. And I think the kids are no different than us. We want to come into a work environment, like a school environment, that's inspiring, that challenges us, where we're supported, where we feel safe, where we're doing things that engage us, that we have a sense of being respected, and we're part of a group that's doing the same thing. And that is what social and emotional processes bring to school. Every one of these things, it makes a successful workplace, and it makes for a successful school, and it's the kind of environment in which our kids really deserve to be. So now we have the common core, and we've got to deal with that reality, generally speaking, although some folks say not, but you know, it's not about the common core, it's about any set of standards. The set of standards that we give people has to become embedded in their minds and hearts. Otherwise, it's just gonna be another way to game the system. People are gonna just try to figure out how do I score well without really getting into what's truly necessary. And so we have to understand that simply passing the accountability assessment is not enough for kids to manage in this complex world. And we also have to know that we're trying to combat a legacy of inequities. Uh, this is a statement by President Johnson, 1965, that feels unfortunately very fresh today. You do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate him, bring him up to the starting line of a race, and then say, 
you are free to compete with all the others and still justly believe that you have been completely fair. Social and emotional skills is a 21st century issue of equity and social justice. And it doesn't matter how wealthy you are or how poor you are. If you do not have these skills, you are not going to be able to be successful in life. We know this now. And so when it comes time to teach our kids things related to the Common Core, and you've got handouts in your packet that have a little bit more detail on this if you'd like to look at them. But no matter what Common Core skill we want our kids to get, skills that they need for future success in life, social and emotional factors are part of it. So if I'm going to deal with the complexity of text, it may sound a little technical, but if I'm going to delve into complex text, and I've never done that before, how am I going to do that? I'm going to need to be patient. I'm going to need to concentrate. I'm going to need to be tolerant to the people around me who maybe are getting it faster than I am. I'm going to have to learn how to get help from the people around me. If I can't do that, I'm not going to be able to deal with the texts that you've thrown at me. And, and now that you've thrown them at me, I've got to read them carefully, more carefully than I've ever read them before. And you know what? It's true. We now, in our lives, in our everyday lives, if we don't read stuff carefully, it could be big problems. Big problems. So many things come past us. We sign them, and then we find out, what did we just sign? What did we just agree to? We need our kids to read closely and carefully. But to do that, they are going to need to learn how to control their emotions, to avoid distractions. They're going to need a number of skills related to social and emotional learning. You can go through every single thing in the Common Core and you'll find the exact same set of criteria. So when we think about building our youth of the future, what's the imperative? I'm going to ask you to indulge me for a second. It's nice to have policy, but I want to empower you with a magic wand. I want you to imagine that you've got a magic wand and you're going to be able to wave it over children and have them internalize three values forever and ever and ever. Take a look at this list. Friendship, long life, peace, riches, wisdom, popularity, beauty, and family. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Think about the three of these values that you would most want all children to have if you could do it with a wave of the wand. And then after you've thought about it, share it with somebody next to you to see if you're on the same or similar wavelength. And don't do it telepathically. <laughs> I'm timing. You've got 30 seconds. <laughs> All right, let me, uh, in, in the interest of time, let me do a quick poll. First ever Capital Visitor Center poll of values. This is an exciting moment, and we have it on film, and it's being tweeted. It, it's amazing. All right. How many of you, as any one of your top three choices, how many of you had friendship? Talk about friendship. How many of you talked about wisdom? How many of you talked about family? How many of you talked about peace? How many of you can't count to three? <laughs> what do you think of the values that are being most forced on our kids by the mass culture today? Riches, Riches popularity. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. You got it? This is why we have to do this in this school, and this is why schools have to do it in partnership with families. Because our kids are being really given alternative messages to the messages that most of us really, really do want them to have. And so if we don't intentionally teach the skills of character and discernment, of ethical decision making and collaboration, the culture will take our kids in a very different direction. So the standard that I now use when I talk to educators, as I do all the time, is a golden, uh, the golden rule is a little too weak for me. 24 karat golden rule, do unto your children as you would have other, do unto your students as you would have other people do unto your own children. But there's a higher standard now. Do unto your students as you would have other people do unto your own grandchildren. <laughs> that is a standard 
that never fails as we try to take all children, every child, including my grandson, and work to make them college, career, contribution, and life ready. Thank you. So it's not abusive to raise your grandchild to be a Yankee fan? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, couldn't help it. Janice, go ahead. Good afternoon. So I thought of one more emotional connection that I had after I listened to you, listening to you. So my same 14-year-old son, you know that marijuana is now legal in Washington State, right? And so we saw some people, they're not supposed to be doing this, but we saw them smoking marijuana in their car, what appeared to be like they were doing it, and he said, I'm not going to do drugs. I'm not going to do that because I have too much to risk. So I was very proud of them for saying that, even though it is legal. <laughs> so um, Denise, I'm with Denise Louis Education Center. And so we serve about 400 uh, children birth to five in Seattle and King County. And we operate the Head Start and Early Head Start program. And we also have funding from the Maternal Infant Early Childhood Home Visiting Program, or McV for short. Um, the children that we serve are primarily children of color. 83% um, of our families have income below the federal poverty line, which for a family of four is about, uh, about $24,000 a year. Um, even, though, even though they're below the poverty line, 75% uh, of our families are two-parent families, or two-thirds are two-parent families, and 75% of them work. So they are working, they're contributing to society, and yet they're low income. Um, and also, a majority of our families are limited English speakers, so about 80% speak another language other than English. Um, so why start early? Um, a previous speaker has alluded to this, but maybe you don't know this, but um, the difference between a child in poverty and a, and a wealthy family um, is about 30 million words by the time a child is four. So for a wealthy, a wealthy child and being brought up in a wealthy family will have heard 30 million more words by the time they're four than a child in poverty. Um, there is already uh, disparities in cognitive, social, and behavior and health outcomes by nine months. And by the time a child is four, there's an 18-month achievement gap. Um, impulse control is also a better indicator of future academic success than IQ. And trauma exposure is the equivalent to uh, a seven-point IQ loss, which is even greater than, uh, if same or greater than the effects of lead exposure. Um, some other data that we, we also um, found was that 70% of children in child welfare have a speech delay and 45% of children in foster care have a developmental delay. So this really underscores how attachment and responsive parenting create a foundation for learning. And that kids in foster care or in the child welfare system that don't have positive interactions or encouragement from their parents suffer with lower IQ scores or diagnosable delays. Um, but the good news is that if we start early, these statistics can be changed dramatically. Um, so this slide shows um, our th three and four year olds. Um, we identified kids that had um, greater social emotional concerns in classrooms. So these are the kids that would be kicked out of preschool. But in Head Start, we don't kick kids out of preschool. So what we did was we implemented a, pro, a 10 week program called the Incredible Years that work with both the children in small groups and also with the parents on some tools and skills that they could use to improve their behavior. So in the fall, their um, behavior problems were much higher than they were in the spring, so this graph goes down. So this, um, this, this slide shows a particular family that I'm gonna show you in just a minute. Um, so this is a parent that we did a pre-test um, that assessed her affection, responsiveness, encouragement, and teaching. And then we, um, we did an intervention called the Circle of Security with this family, with several families. And after that intervention, it showed a huge increase in her affection, responsiveness, encouragement, and teaching. So I'm going to show you the before video. Uh-oh. 
Ali? No, okay. Sounds good? And then um, the after video, which is after our circle of security um, parent training. Oh, ahí está el gato en la pared, pero ¿dónde está el reloj? ¿Dónde? ¿Dónde es el niño? ¿Es el niño? No, no. ¿Dónde está el reloj que te enseñé? ¿Quieres ayuda? ¿Quieres ayuda? ¿Dónde está? Mira, aquí está, mira. So does anybody notice any difference between the first video and the second video? What was different? She was talking more, yeah. Anything else? Eye contact. There yeah. was eye contact between the mom and the Definitely. Dad. More eye contact, more engagement. Asking questions. Right? The TV wasn't talking. Okay. <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah. Yes, definitely. She celebrated when he, he got something. Let's say celebrated. So which style of parenting do you think is going to help her child be more successful in school? The first or the second? Second. Which style of parenting do you think is going to narrow that 30 million word gap? Second. So yeah, you can see a big difference just from a very brief um, intervention with the circle of security. Um, so um, moving on to three to five year olds, um, we talked to kindergarten teachers and we asked them, you know, what do you what do you want us to teach the kids before they enter kindergarten? And um, Invariably, they all say, they all focus on social emotional. We want kids to solve problems, control their impulse, sit quietly in a circle time, make friends, be kind to each other, and take turns. So these are all of the social emotional skills that, that we've been talking about this morning. Um, so I'm going to show you a little brief video of how we do that at Denise Louis Education Center. Remember the rule, the second step rule? What we need to, to do when we have a circle time? Who remember? Okay. Eyes for watching. Uh -huh. Ears for whistling. Body still. Yes. Is he feeling sad? No. Happy. He's feeling happy. How can you tell he's feeling happy? Because he's smiling. Because he smiles. So when you smile, what do you see? Smiling. Mm. Can, can you look at your friends and smile? Is this feeling the same or different? Different. Different. Because this one is? And this one? Happy. Happy. So, um, so you're all kindergarten teachers. Who would you rather have in your classroom? The children that, from Teacher Trondra's class that learn that eyes are, for list, eyes are for watching, ears are for listening, body still? Or would you rather have to spend three months teaching your children how to do that? Yeah. So the, you'd, want, you'd want her graduates, right? Yeah. <laughs> her kids. So um, it makes a huge, huge difference. Uh, especially, and our and our kindergarten partners, our um, school partners, tell us that they can spot a Denise Louis graduate um, from a crowd of kindergartners because they are so ready for school. They know what to do, and um, it really is uh, makes a big difference. And then, and this is my last slide. This is um, our school readiness data for from last year. And these are the four-year-olds in fall, winter, and spring in um, several different areas. So the first area is um, touching, hearing, seeing, and moving, which is physical development and health. The second is building relationships, which is so social-emotional. The third is about me, my family culture, which is so social-emotional approaches to learning and social studies. The fourth is math, science, social studies, and creative arts. And the fifth area is language and learning. So you see that. I mean, we, we wouldn't be able to, to get those outcomes without an emphasis in social emotional learning. And that remember that these are the kids that 80, 83% are below poverty, about 80% are limited English, and many of them have never been in a, a classroom or a school setting. So um, um, when we invest in social emotional learning, you can see the results that the kids, um, when they come in from the fall to the, to the spring, um, it makes a huge difference, so I encourage you to continue our investment and our work in social-emotional learning. 
Thank you. Keith. So I teach freshmen, and it's like herding cats, and I cannot do that from my seat, so I'm going to stand at the podium. All right. Clicker. Yeah. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I believe that is the core message that I can best deliver on the topic of social and emotional learning. You guys have already heard great theory and research on how SEL works and what it looks like. Um, and now today, I'm gonna hopefully bring you the front lines. My name is Keith Matheny. I'm a high school teacher at Austin High School, and I teach methods for academic and personal success, or MAPS. This is one of my seven classes, and this picture is actually from an upcoming uh, magazine article in Live Happy Magazine. MAPS is a freshman seminar course that is part of the regular school day. The class focuses on teaching social and emotional skills and academic supports in a very collaborative and engaging environment. I'm also a national model teacher for School Connect, which is a research-based SEL curriculum for high school. This curriculum is designed to be implemented in a variety of ways, but primarily in high school advisory programs or in a dedicated course like MAPS, with the ideal model being a combination of both. I directly teach over 300 at-risk freshmen every year, in addition to helping train and support another 40 teachers that are giving the same lessons um, across our district to over 1,200 students. I can speak from the front lines on the need for social and emotional learning in high school, how it is implemented, and its very significant effects on students. Ninth grade is clearly a make or break year. More students fail ninth grade than any other year, and a disproportionate number of the students that are held back in ninth grade end up being dropouts. The current national average dropout is 20%, uh, which as Tim um, alluded to, has improved a little. However, a high school dropout is three times as likely to be unemployed, four times as likely to live in poverty, and a whopping 63 times as likely to be incarcerated. In addition to those staggering numbers, 40% of employers, as um, uh, Dr. Elias alluded to a few minutes ago, have really, have really in a recent study by the College Board talked about how these skills are sorely lacking in our high school and college graduates entering the workforce. That SEL skills are critical to workplace success. Freshman year is an ideal time to create an engaging collaborative success skills course designed to help freshmen transition into high school while learning the social and emotional skills needed to succeed in school, work, and life. This type of class not only builds skills, but also really helps students feel connected and can build a great sense of class community. Before starting our program at Austin High, we found that over 60% of the failures on our campus were from the freshman class, and over 60% of the discipline referrals on our campus were from the freshman class. Since implementing this program four years ago, we've seen a 30% reduction in dropouts, a 41% reduction in class failures and an amazing 71% reduction in discipline referrals. These are transformative numbers affecting every aspect of our school. And I'd like to show you a short video of what the class looks like and a couple of interviews of student comments. I think a lot of freshmen, like they have to settle into high school. Because me personally, I think there's a big difference between middle school and high school. So I'm like, Settling in, it was hard. But Mr. Matheny helped me with the planners and like learning little things that helped you go further in life. It's a big deal, you know, to be able to learn these things. In the beginning of the year, he taught us at a handshake that people would judge you on it. So you have to have like a good mesh and like a strong, firm handshake. I didn't know that before that your handshake was like like a first impression thing. We did a lesson the other day where we put the rocks and beans in a cup and the beans represented little things like time like on your phone and the rock represented like projects and stuff and it helps us understand like get the lesson across better. We're just one big family, we all got along together and like someday some kid probably had a bad day but we're all there for him like cheering him on. You get to talk about 
personal things if you choose to and like it helps you be more open. It taught us how to be proactive and except for reactive. After my parents got divorced, it was kind of hard. And my dad, we were arguing a lot, and I used to like punch, hole, punch holes in the wall in my anger. But then after, after proactive reactive, and my dad would argue, I would just go to my room, just scream at a pillow or something. It's beside like hurting myself, being proactive, then doing a reactive as hurting myself and punching the wall. At the beginning of the class, I was just stubborn. I was really stubborn. I didn't like talking. I didn't like doing any of that. And throughout the whole process, he was always there, he was on me, he was like, you do this and you, and so that, like, that bettered me. Like, I got, my whole attitude changed from that class. So those kids are awesome kids. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so one of the activities in the video was Rocks in a Jar, a lesson many of you may be familiar with from business courses in college or from Stephen Covey's uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. This lesson helps students build a critical skill of identifying what's most important in their lives, the big rocks, and what's least important, the time wasters represented by the beans. Learning to put big rocks first and prioritize leads to huge changes in students' lives, I assure you. Barring the analogy from the lesson, some may think that social and emotional learning programming is one of the beans. But in reality, in my perspective, from teaching 300 freshman students per year, social emotional programming is perhaps the largest rock in the educational jar. Over the past four years and 1,200 students, I've seen many impacts from students internalizing and applying these lessons. The academic support lessons on using planners, effective note taking, test preparation, and the overall importance of education have resulted in many stories of recovered grades and improved achievement. Many of my students have made academic honor roll for the first time ever in their lives since taking this course. One student, Leslie, shared with the class that she couldn't wait to see her mom for the first time in months in an activity that we say call good news. She then explained that her mother was in prison and she couldn't wait to tell her she'd made honor roll for the first time. It was the first time Leslie had made honor roll since second grade. Sorry, <laughs> that one always gets me. She made honor roll five out of the six report cards that year. The self-management lessons on stress management and anger management have resulted in great stories from students, teachers, and administrators reporting students using these strategies to calm down or prevent blow-ups. In this lesson, we teach three levels of mental processing using your hand for a model. There are basically three levels to your brain. Your brain stem or your autopilot, your limbic system or your emotional center, and your computer brain or your neocortex. Emotions are very powerful, and when left unmanaged, they will emotionally hijack our brains. In essence, we flip our lids, disconnecting our thinking brain from our emotional brain, and basically just reacting emotionally to whatever's going on in the situation, often making bad decisions and creating damage to our relationships. When we learn to manage and control our emotions, we can calm down and reconnect that thinking brain, that computer brain, so we can be more careful and proactive with our decisions and with our relationships. Perhaps the most compelling is the mental health component. These skills help students deal with stress, conflict, and depression. Also, many students have shared personal information which has led me to refer them to and get them counseling services for the first time. This kind of class is excellent identification and referral for needy students and quality services. This way we can often get them help when the issues are still puddles and not pitfalls. In the four years before this program started, there were three tr very tragic completed suicides at Austin High School. In the four years since the program started at Austin High, there have been none. In my class this year, I have two students who lost a parent this summer. I have four students who are getting counseling for self-injurious behavior. I have six homeless students, 21 dealing with a recent divorce, and many, many more who are identified as at risk. Our students need these kinds of skills and services. I love what I do, and I know firsthand that it makes a world of difference for students. So when it comes to policy and support of SEL, what is the question? The question is not whether SEL impacts academic achievement. It clearly does. At Austin High, it's reduced 
class failures by 41%. The question is not whether social emotional learning helps students see the importance of education and persistence. It clearly does. At Austin High, we reduce dropouts by 30%. The question is not whether social and emotional learning helps students manage their emotions and behavior. It most clearly does. At Austin High School, we've reduced discipline referrals by a whopping 71%. The real question is, as educational leaders and policymakers, which side of the quote, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, do we want to be on? Quality prevention or attempted cure? And remember, that some of these issues have no cures. And some of these issues are very costly to our society. And some of them are final, like suicide. There are needy freshmen all over the country, and to quote from our superintendent, it is educational malpractice not to implement these programs. I'm very honored for this opportunity to speak. I would like to thank Committee for Children and CASEL for putting this on. And I thank you for your time, and I encourage you to please help this cause. Thank you very much. So we're going to show uh, maybe, uh, actually, why don't we hold this yeah, just for a second and just see if uh, we've got a few minutes left. Um, there are, sorry, there are as many experts or almost as many experts in the audience as there are on, on the panel. So there might be interest in some comments or questions. Uh, uh, we, we, we spent a little time on rigor, a little time on evidence, a little time on accountability, uh, maybe not enough. So there might be real questions from, poly, from, from folks uh, from the Hill who are thinking, you know, how do we make sure we move this forward, or from uh, constituents who are interested in this work that think there are points that we didn't quite hit. So maybe we'll just take a quick pause to see uh, if there are comments or um, questions. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Rob Muller with um, SRI Education. I had a, a comment and a question. And the comment is, is this. Um, you know, we've been talking mostly about K-12. I think this is a really important issue in um, preparation for uh, post-secondary education as well. There's research coming out about students who succeed in remediation in math and English language arts. And it's you know, grit and perseverance and the qualities that you're talking about that contribute to um, you know, students succeeding in post-secondary. My question is, about stovepipes versus integration, right? When I hear talk about this topic, on the one hand, I kind of see the need for separate programming. On the other hand, I really worry about you know going the same you know same same thing that happened to character education, civic education, uh, service learning, critical thinking. You know, separate stovepipes, not integrated, really into the main educational enterprise. And I'm just curious, you know, from the panel's perspective, how do we avoid? Coming another add-on program you do over here, and not really part of the, you know, the fundamental learning process. You want to do? Yeah. Um, so great question, Rob. Thanks for asking it. Um, and it's a it's a it's a very active debate within the field. Uh, you know, my quick answer would be that it's not an either or. Uh, that when you do good English language or language arts instruction, you infuse it into social studies and you infuse it in, in, into science, and yet you do spend some dedicated time on the kinds of fundamental skills and language arts that are necessary. Our, the reason to represent that house is not to say that SEL becomes another, uh, if you will, stovepipe in the house. It's to say that a uh, thorough approach, a, a coordinated and uh, sequentially uh, 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 designed approach to implementation will allow schools to pick the ways in which it, skills are taught either infused in academic instruction or in dedicated time, will we'll, we'll make decisions about how they are modeled in the climate and by the adults in the school and how they're modeled in discipline policies and so on, and will choose ways in which they can be extended to community-based organizations, religious organizations, and families. There is not a one-size-fits-all. What CASEL has done, uh, and I have a couple copies of this, is try to make sure that educators have the tools to make those decisions. So this is a recent guide to programs uh, at the uh, preschool and elementary school level. <clears throat> a principal or a superintendent can use this to make the, exactly the kinds of decisions I think what you're suggesting really only, for instance, Keith at Austin will know how much time he can take away from skill instruction, how much time he needs to dedicate to that skill instruction. Five years from now, that mix might be different than it is today or was five years ago. Um, so I would say that I, a lot of people want infused 
uh, skills, attitudes, and values into academic instruction. I think we all love that, but we don't think, uh, most people would say, we have to be dedicated and conscious of ensuring that the skills and the relationships are cultivated, and that infusion doesn't mean dissolution of focus. Um, so that's kind of a both and answer, but I think the best educators find both and solutions here using highly, uh, highly tested uh, uh, systems and methods and programs to do it. Mo, do you want to? Well, I just, I think the, the, um, the, the step forward in our thinking really is that just as in the schoolhouse you need reading every place, but we do teach it someplace. And now we know that you need social and emotional competencies every place. And if we want kids to have them, then we need to make sure that someplace we're doing this, and in a developmentally appropriate and continuous way. Again, just like we don't teach reading in a couple of grades and then drop it. So, so I, I think it's a parallel, as we understand now that this is another set of skills that has to be pervasive, and if we don't do it intentionally, then we can't be sure that all kids are going to get it. The one thing I'd like to add is that I believe that um, it it really helps to have the compartmentalized part of it as well because when you have somebody that specializes in it and is passionate about it and teaches it like a course, you can get much more depth. And I think that, yeah, SEL needs to fill in all the cracks as well in the school and the climate and integration and all the classes, but having someone that is well-trained that really is passionate about it is a really powerful way to teach the skills um, in, a, in, in a classroom and in a school. So so I think it's important to have both. Any other comments or questions? Uh, yes, please. Uh, my question is, how are um, SEL programs modified to teach uh, students with disabilities? I should, but I just want to share the microphone. Um, uh, well, the answer is, um, in lots of ways, uh, there are some programs that have dedicated training uh, uh, time for teachers who are teaching special needs children so that rubrics and things like that can be broken down into simpler uh, skills and the sequence of instruction is extended a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. Others, um, depending on the developmental level, uh, will focus more on uh, you know, inclusive practices and using inclusive classrooms as ways to teach particular skills around problem solving or relationship skills so that kids with special needs uh, become fully integrated into the, not only the skill instruction, but the actual content of the, and, and the use of the skill. Um, I, I would say my own view is that we have not yet solved the problem completely of a child with, let's say, intellectual or developmental differences entering a school and having uh, a high quality social and emotional learning curriculum or, or experience K-12. So. Um, and there, there's some, there are other special need, specialized issues around, for instance, cultural adaptability and cultural bilingual, bilingualness. Um, some programs have spent a lot of time, when I say programs, I mean people that have developed really high quality curricula. Some people have spent a lot of time on uh, cultural, uh, becoming culturally bilingual or trilingual in the way in which skills are taught and modeled and the way in which teachers are prepared. Others have not done as much on that area. So I would say that's one of the areas we're still, we're still working on. Yes, Jan. So, um, so remember the video I showed you with the mom, with the, with the, kid, with the two kids, and um, after the circle of security. So that, those children were both, um, we were trying to get a referral for speech delays for both of them, because neither of them spoke. But if you saw out on the second video, they were, you know, the one that we saw was speaking quite well and no longer qualified for speech, a speech referral. So because the parent had these additional skills and ways to engage, then the speech referral wasn't necessary. So I'd just like to also chime in. I have quite a few special needs students in my classroom, um, a very large number of them. And I would say these kinds of programs do more than just educate. They make the climate way more friendly for special needs students. And I think that's a, a big important part 
of social emotional learning is creating a classroom climate where all students are accepted and feel connected to the classroom. And then the other thing, just to kind of emphasize this, believe it or not, I have a student um, who has uh, a social anxiety issue, and I'm thrilled to report that in very recent uh, recent developments, he was elected class president or class representative for one of my classes. So just kind of speaks for when you develop a climate of acceptance and you know um, appreciating all students, you you really can uh, help kids feel more comfortable and shine. So I think that's kind of connects to that. And, and finally, um, one brief historical note is that many of these programs actually got started uh, with kids that had various uh, severe difficulties and have worked their way into the mainstream, so historically. But, you know, the question is like, so who has a disability? So in, in one school district in which I worked, Highland Park, um, New Jersey, what they found was that, that uh, one person's disability is one thing and then other people have a disability. So they're in creating a way of helping the school better accommodate students with autism. They found that the largest disability was in the student body that didn't have autism because they didn't understand it. So the focus of the program was to educate all the students in the school about autism and the behaviors and characteristics of students with autism and how they need to be treated and understood. So if somebody's biting you or hitting you, it's, you know, this is what, it's not personal. This is part of their particular condition. And uh, they won a number of awards for that approach. And we're a very friendly, accommodating place that parents literally began moving to because they knew their children wouldn't be thought of as having some sort of a specialized condition, but their presence in the school sort of uplifted the entire school to just become more aware of differences. And so if you take that and you multiply it by the whole range of diverse conditions that can happen in school, just imagine the change that that brings to the climate of a school. Pretty substantial. So we're, we're pretty much out of time. I just want to make two quick closing comments. Take Keith's statistics for a second. Uh, you heard uh, him with great uh, smarts and emotion describe some of the changes. But we just, uh, he did a little, um, we did a little fun math. So if you took those statistics and extrapolated them, if you implemented high quality social and emotional learning programs in high schools for freshmen in the way that that's been done at Austin High School, across the United States in 27,000 high schools, <clears throat> you'd have 24 million additional passing grades, 24 million additional passing grades. You'd have 8.6 million fewer discipline referrals. 8.6 million fewer discipline referrals in American high schools if they all had evidence-based, high-quality, well-implemented, expertly taught social and emotional learning programs, 12 million more hours of time on task for teachers, um, just extrapolating from the data of one school, and we can only guess with, uh, with suicide and, and severe depression, uh, you know, you can never know for sure, but if you lost three lives um, uh, because of uh, the, the pain of severe depression, and we could save, uh, that number of lives and extrapolate that across the United States, you can just uh, imagine the numbers of 13 and 14 and 15 year and 16 and 17 year olds who are not uh, facing uh, the most uh, horrific of conditions, which is the sense in which their life is not worth living. Um, we didn't invite you here only to inspire you. We invited you also to ask you to work and work hard um, uh, we, there are two pieces of legislation, Congressman Ryan's and Congressman, Congresswoman Davis's legislation, uh, which are uh, floating around in this place, uh, which we'd love to get some traction on. <clears throat> but I think the main uh, message here is that, uh, as, as Maurice said, we're past the tipping point. It is time for f responsible federal policymakers to create frameworks for the ways in which a pro-social, pro-child, teaching and learning oriented uh, reform agenda is infused into the way in which public policy is written and adequate and thorough attention is paid to the social and emotional dimensions of learning and to the needs of children and to the teachers and families in which uh, they're living and growing up. So uh, we'll, leave, we'll maybe put the video on, but I think there's still, I'm not sure if there's still food back there. Is it gone? No, a couple of 
We bit. understand and we have Special again thanks research to, Joe, to show that for children. Thank these you all are for skills, coming. these yes. five competencies Roger, are necessary for success both at the student level as well as adults. You need to be self-aware, you need to have self-management skills in order to do well in life. You can have the best looking transcript ever, but if you have trouble making friends, if you have trouble getting along with people, you're going to have a really hard time in the grown up world. I believe that college begins in kindergarten. I think that is so important. We need to start sowing those seeds at an early age so that if I want my students to progress and be college ready, we need to start talking about that now. My dream is to become a leader, to do something great, and these skills are going to help me to reach out to other people, to be able to like connect with them in a different way. And we do know that the number one reason people lose their jobs is lack of social skills. So we have to constantly remind people in the academic area that is really what SEL, in my mind, is about. Of course, making happy kids and happy families, but also make them be able to interact in a really effective way so that they can take those skills into the workplace. If I were speaking to other principals about SEL, I would say run toward it as fast as you can. It's critical.